So I'm going to talk a little bit about the book itself, um, and uh, but taking some advice from one of my teachers, Diskin Clay, never to repeat myself. I'm actually going to talk a little bit about something that's come out as I was um, finishing the book um, that I think is along these lines. It's a little more specific with the hopes that maybe some of you can help me think about that too. Um, I find it useful to talk a little bit about where I'm coming from and who I am before uh, diving into the argument. So I will do that and then uh, go into the argument. So this is where I'm reading from. Um, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest of the United States around Seattle and do, doing a lot of hiking. Uh, so this is me on a backpacking trip a year or two ago. And doing that uh, brought me into a specific relationship with nature that feels to me now that I've been reading thinking about Herodotus quite Herodotian, a deep appreciation, especially for rivers, which is something I'm gonna talk about. Uh, rivers really uh, constitute the civilization in the Pacific Northwest, providing power, providing fish, uh, providing recreation now. And I think rivers are something Herodotus is really interested in that's helpful for thinking about the Anthropocene. Um, I'm a political theorist. My degree is in political science, and not all political theorists even think that we should spend any time with uh, ancient texts and classics texts. Uh, that's something that I've always wanted to do, and it was sort of my interest in uh, democracy that led me to think about ancient Athens and Greece in the first place. And that's something that I did in my first book uh, called What Would Socrates Do, which came out in 2014. And I think one of the, a couple of reasons why political theorists read classics is um, they help us, us political theorists who are maybe obsessed too much with the contemporary moment to ask questions we may have forgotten to ask. Uh, Socrates is a great example of that. They disrupt assumptions about the way of the world and what we take to be normal. Um, and they provide different perspectives from which to consider the present. And that, of course, is something I think Herodotus is especially useful for. Um, Herodotus in the Anthropocene begins from the idea that we're in this crisis of the Anthropocene, which I'll talk a little bit more about at the end of the presentation, but which is uh, both a very specific scientific term for the advent of uh, massive fossil fuel burning and the changes to the atmosphere and to the Earth's sort of geological history as a result and a very political and somewhat nebulous term to describe human uh, induced climate change. And climate change, of course, holds all sorts of different changes in it. Uh, so this is a problem that has occupied me and some of you, I'm sure, uh, for a long time. And the need for a different kind of approach uh, uh, seems really strong because we're not really making headway politically uh, or uh, philosophically for that matter. And I found Herodotus to be really useful there. So he offers a creative political response outside the dominant ones, um, who's thinking also about how much human activities affect the non-human, uh, which is a term I'll use to describe both non-human animals and non-human environment, things that are relatively inert or at least not living. Um, and that he's thinking about these things in interrelationship uh, with a sense of ability towards dynamic complexity. So political scientists love to think about parsimony, which means like finding the clearest, uh, uh, most straightforward explanation. And I say that in, in my department among political scientists, I'm the complicator. And Herodotus, of course, is a wonderful complicator of telling story upon story. Um, and as uh, Christopher Pelling's recent book uh, explained, like there's never a there there, or there's rarely a there there to find when you're trying to see, search out the ITOs. So here's what I'm gonna talk about uh, the next uh, 30 minutes or so. Um, I'm gonna talk about Herodotus's histories and non-humans a little bit. Um, I already said where I'm reading from, and then I'm gonna focus on Rivers and Herodotus um, and then draw out what I think might be some political insights um, that are articulable in his context uh, in the ancient world. And then what those insights then might uh, say to the present 21st century context of the Anthropocene or Anthropocene. So just a few words about Herodotus's histories and political theory. And this may not be news for some of you, but uh, when I was going back through these slides, I was thinking it would be useful for those who don't uh, really have a sense of this academic discipline, which is in, a, in many ways the one that I'm trying to bring Herodotus to uh, in the same way that I'm trying to bring the Anthropocene to other uh, people who are thinking about Herodotus. Um, he's not part of the typical political theory canon. So I think it's, I was not taught Herodotus. Uh, it was only when given the chance to teach a course of my own devising that I said, I really wanna teach Herodotus and think about uh, in particular, his approach 
to um, understanding political phenomena. And I ended up writing an essay uh, published in political theory a few years ago called Herodity and Realism, which came out of teaching a course that put Thucydides, which is, is taught in political science uh, generally, next to Herodotus. And Thucydides is usually thought of as the four, uh, founder of realism, but I was arguing that Herodotus has much more of a bottom-up uh, kind of self-reflective uh, mode that uh, I think merits the title of realist. So in political theory and uh, political science, Plato and Aristotle are generally the texts that are uh, treated the most. And among the historian Thucydides, of course, uh, is famously misused um, as Polly Lowe can attest to um, uh, uh, among others. Um, and usually Herodotus is pitted against Thucydides, but at most maybe is the constitutional debate is read. Um, occasionally sort of there's discussion of isonomia uh, with some reference to Herodotus. Uh, Josiah Ober, Ober's work has read a lot in political science and political theory, and he has some references to Herodotus, but doesn't really think about Herodotus as a political thinker. Um, and Herodotus is off, sometimes contrasted to Plato and the story of Gyges uh, famously in this sort of contrast between the cultural relativism so-called of Herodotus and the account of justice, which is philosophically rich and deep in Plato. And I'm, these are shorthands of, you know, I, I'm ecumenical in my adoration for most of these thinkers, but uh, this is also about the formation of uh, a canon in political theory and how Herodotus is excluded from that. And Herodotus is often, is sometimes contrasted to Aristotle too, and um, that Aristotle is sort of bounding the polis uh, as the, the place where politics happens and Herodotus is showing how politics is happening beyond a single polis, among polis and among other uh, political forms. So one of the, the sort of motivating um, ideas for this book for me was what would it look like to theorize politics with Herodotus uh, and not just sort of a, bring him into the paradigms that were already there uh, from Thucydides or Aristotle or Plato, but actually sort of thinking from what's organically within um, his work uh, and conceptually what concepts are at work um, in, in his thinking and in the histories. Uh, and one of the sort of broad outlines, and here I'm going to sort of refer uh, in gestures to the book, but I'm happy to be more specific and drill down, especially for those who have read it and have questions or comments about it, even for those who haven't read it and want some more elaboration, that stories are as important as facts, um, that culture or nomos is as important as politics, um, and that there's a diversity of collective forms. And that those are sort of three, I think, big things um, that Herodotus contributes to the way that we've, the stories we've told about ancient political thought and the way we've been thinking about politics from the perspective of, of Thucydides, Plato, and Aristotle. And um, and this is one of the foci of the book, non-humans, um, thinking about the importance of non-humans. And again, that includes both environments and non-human animals um, for thinking about politics. So non-humans is not something that I think a lot of people even think about with Herodotus, um, although there is a fair amount of good work on geography and terrain and things like that, um, and some very good work on the divine and gods. Um, all of which I would put in the category of non-humans. But it's striking, you know, look at the images that we have of Herodotus and usually um, they are focused on the, the sort of conflict, right? And human beings, um, and that's the story that we tell. Um, but I became interested in this and started, especially in rivers, given my personal itinerary growing up in the riverine uh, country and hiking around rivers. And I realized Herodotus has an unbelievable amount of rivers in his histories. Um, I counted 67 rivers uh, with different names. And you can see in my notes, the ones that have boxes around them are ones that were discussed four or more times. Uh, and of course, there are ones that you would come think of immediately, like the Nile uh, and others, but then there, there are many. Um, contrast to that, Thucydides has just 33 rivers, and only seven of them are discussed more than once. Uh, so obviously there's, there's a lot of coverage on something that is then not subsequently discussed much um, in other historians. So I want to talk about two rivers in particular as a way of drawing out some of the insights that I think are in my book, but these, this, I don't actually talk about these rivers in the book because it was a late reader of the manuscript who said to me, you know, you haven't, you've talked a lot about non-humans, but you've never centered non-humans in your account that made me start asking these questions. But at that point, the 
the proofs were in, I couldn't uh, change anything else. Um, but this is a sort of um, an open question, something I'm working on thinking about right now. Um, and inspired a little bit by uh, Wallace Stevens, um, the river is moving, the blackbird must be flying, trying to think about different ways of looking at a river, um, not the only, not uh, coming to some synthetic single account in Herodotus, but actually the, the uh, a manifold number of ways that he brings us to think about rivers. So I think generally the 21st century perspective on what a river is, if you if I were to survey you, um, without having given you this sort of tip off that I'm thinking about in a different way, is that it's a feature in a landscape, right? It's something that shows up on a map uh, or that we have to cross or build a bridge over. It's often a natural boundary. So in my neck of the woods, the Pacific Northwest, uh, the Columbia River is the boundary between the state of Washington and the state of Oregon uh, for much of that, uh, that boundary. It's a resource to be used, whether you're harnessing its power um, or you're fishing uh, its waters or um, using, using it for, to produce um, electricity. And it's a resource to be controlled. A lot of battles happen over rivers um, and uh, the control of that river is allowing access points and movement across the geography. So here are a couple of things that I think Herodotus uh, adds to our account of what a river is. And this is what, a what was a river and what Herodotus illuminates. Uh, it's a potential ally. So it's actually a political actor that can be taken uh, uh, to help you. And that's the way he talks about it with the Scythians. It's a political actor. It creates political communities like the Nile creating the Egyptians. Um, and I'm gonna talk about how those, that happens in a little more detail. So first the Borostenes and the Scythians and then the Nile and the Egyptians. Uh, this is one of the maps that I showed that was on the cover uh, of one of the translations. And just if you can't remember exactly, uh, here is the general region of the Borostenes. It's a little blurry on my image, but it's kind of in the middle, right? Between this C and the Y of Scythia. And then of course the Nile is down here and the main Mediterranean region, the focus of Herodotus's discussion. Um, the Bor there's another image of the Borostenes coming across the, from the top of the map down to the left, flowing into the Black Sea. So an economic actor, Herodotus famously lists uh, a, no a large number of the rivers. I think the, the greatest preponderance of discussion of rivers comes in his discussion of the Scythians in book four. And he describes how the Borostenes is the largest of these rivers after the Ister. And it's not just the most productive uh, in the whole world, um, but it cannot compare. Uh, but apart from the Nile, it's the most productive river. This idea that is, um, it's responsible for all the economy in the area. It's also a cultural actor. So um, Herodotus notes how natural resources are abundantly at their disposal uh, because of the river and the customs follow from that. Uh, and the Scythians response to this, uh, it's being an economic and a cultural actor. So take it as an ally. And this is a passage that I'm curious what others have sort of made of it and grappling with it um, because I think it's really interesting the way that uh, Herodotus describes this the Scythians discovering um, you know this strategy of nomadism and uh, preventing anyone from atta who attacks them from escaping it's made in conformity with the terrain and with the assistance and the word there is sumakos of rivers so taking them as allies as fellow fighters um, and and, and use, using that to develop their uh, political autonomy so the Nile River, uh, that's just a, a quick quick glance towards the Scythians and I'm happy to talk more about that too. Some of you may have experienced this. This is I didn't have quite this view, but the first time that I spotted the Nile when I was flying to East Africa um, was incredibly moving. It's just so, so beautiful down there um, and the Nile Delta. So it, the Nile is unpredictable. Um, and I think that's an interesting like political phenomenon that Herodotus is trying to get his readers to grapple with, uh, that it's, there's more to be said about it. It behaves differently from any river. Um, so it is uh, idiosyncratic, but it's also transformative. So he talks about how the Nile um, allows for conditions where people are taking ferries across the plain, which he's you know, wondering at, it's amazing. It's constantly changing Egypt and uh, changing the region much more so then than now. It's volitional. And here's another passage that I would be curious what you all um, who have thought about this uh, would think. This idea that the Nile might decide to change its course and flow into the Arabian Gulf. 
um, that not only is it unpredictable, but it might, uh, it has a sort of ability to resolve and shift or potentially could, it's imaginable that it might do such a thing. And unlike the Scythians who take the, their river as an ally, the Egyptians response is different. Uh, and I think interesting, he says that the Egyptians treat everything that they've gained as a gift from the river. Um, and so there's this, this gift giving economy, this kind of sense of reciprocity that Herodotus seems to be gesturing towards, which is admirable because he finds so much admirable in the Egyptian uh, life with the Nile. So just to break down some of the lessons that are coming from these passages in the river as I see it, the Borastenes River, you see the river shaping the economy and shaping the culture as, an, as actors um, and that it can be taken as an ally, as a fellow actor, uh, a, a co-warrior. And the Nile is unpredictable, it's transformative, and it's volitional, and the response is taking the Nile as a gift and uh, developing practices of reciprocity. So what? So I think there are two, two ways that uh, I think about this question. What is, one is contextual, what was Herodotus doing? And obviously there's a fair amount of speculation in thinking about uh, why he was do, giving this kind of account in his work uh, in his day. Um, and then the other way of thinking about it is where might Herodotus lead us now? So if we're in a position where we think about rivers in the way that I outlined earlier, um, in a much more um, sort of objectified or as Heidegger would say, enframed sense, um, how does that challenge or lead us to different kinds of thought about rivers and about politics and political life? So three thoughts about um, Herodotus in his own context. Um, one is that uh, he might be leading us to appreciate rivers. Um, and I think this is a pretty, uh, it's a softball, a relatively straightforward reading. Um, and this is a picture of the Columbia River uh, and its beauty and the sort of uh, riverine uh, canyons that it's cut. And thinking about them, not just as objects to be used, but as subjects and potential actors as things worthy of respect. And I think that would make sense given the sort of divinity ascribed to rivers um, that uh, Herodotus must have grown up with that's in Homer and elsewhere. And part of that appreciation is in sort of Wallace Stevens fashion, inquiring from as many perspectives as possible. So thinking about how um, the river is not just uh, appreciated in a Greek way, but also in a Scythian or an Egyptian way. But you might also think about Herodotus as instigating change and trying to incite in his uh, Greek readers uh, responses or interactions with rivers similar to the Scythians or the Egyptians. Um, and this is the Hoover, the, not the Hoover Dam, the uh, Grand Coulee Dam on the Columbia, one of the largest dams on earth, uh, which produces power, uh, probably uh, allowing us to have this conversation. Amazon Web Services and many other uh, web portals are based around uh, where this cheap power is accessible. Also killed many, many salmon runs. Uh, so learning from the Scythians, uh, freedom and thinking about how taking rivers as allies and knowing their contours and uh, working alongside them uh, can lead to a certain kind of freedom that's admirable. Uh, and learning from the Egyptians, this reciprocity and this sense of um, a kind of reverence towards the river uh, and treating it as everything that it gives as a gift. And, I think I didn't quote the particular passages, but in general, thinking about how Herodotus is wondering at these rivers and um, sort of exclaiming at their, their beauty, their miraculousness, um, and thus leading his readers into that attitude of wonder too. But you might also think in a third way of uh, how Herodotus is warning. And this is the Hanford nuclear site, uh, which is on the Columbia. Of course, you know, like many governments, you've got a big river. Well, we better build some nuclear power plants and some uranium processing facilities on there and use the water to cool things. So uh, the, a warning, don't do this to your river, right? Uh, respect rivers uh, and respect earthly flourishing. And uh, uh, again, my photo is from the 21st century, but I think we could uh, point to many stories where he shows actors disrespecting rivers in particular, but um, non-human actors um, who pay the price in some form. So to move to the Anthropocene um, and think about uh, what Herodotus might say to this moment. So as I, uh, I said before, the Anthropocene um, is a technical term to describe a new climactic period in which humanity as a whole has initiated global change. And in this scientific sense, there's, there's debate about it still, um, but generally people say it began around 1800 when methane and CO2 shifted the atmosphere, the Earth's atmosphere began to shift. And this image is um, 
looks like the hockey stick of carbon emissions um, going up, but it's actually just mentions of the Anthropocene as a term, uh, which is identical, um, but slightly delayed. So there are three potential implications, I think, for thinking about the Anthropocene with Herodotus. Um, one is thinking about Herodotus as an advocate, um, so or other non-humans as plaintiffs, uh, as, um, as beings and subjects that need the case to be made for them. A second is to treat Herodotus as a historian and make and center rivers as, or other non-humans um, as subjects of inquiry, uh, as opposed to centering human beings. And then thinking about Herodotus as a political theorist, taking rivers up as political actors. Uh, and again, these I think are all things that follow from the general approach that I'm developing on my book, but not things that I actually do there yet um, or have done yet. Uh, this, this is a wonderful um, passage from Justice William O. Douglas, Justice of the US Supreme Court in a dissenting opinion where he describes rivers um, as the living symbol of all the life it sustains or nourishes. Fish, aquatic insects, water oozels, otters, fisher, deer, elk, bear, and all other animals, including man, who are dependent on it or who enjoy it for its sight, its sound, or its life. Um, so he describes how people must be able to speak for the values the river represents and which are threatened with destruction. And I think this is a, an evocation of what it would look like to take the to, to treat Herodotus today as an advocate, as calling our attention to the need for uh, to, to argue on behalf of rivers and see them as these living symbols of all the life they sustained, which I think is one, a, a beautiful way of capturing the way that rivers, one way that rivers function in his text. Uh, another way is to think about Herodotus as a historian. And uh, here is an image of uh, the historian Richard Wright's really wonderful and short, very readable book on the Columbia River, The Organic Machine. And he writes, that the Columbia River is an energy system, which although modified by human interventions, maintains its natural, its unmade qualities. So he centers, and he's, he's distinctive in this, not a lot of historians, uh, contemporary historians I know are doing this. He centers the non-human thing, the river, and he gives it uh, a degree of agency. It's not simply something that is controlled. It maintains its natural unmade qualities. So nature isn't conquered, but it's labored with and nature often stymies these labors. So last, thinking about Herodotus as a political theorist, um, I, in my account of the book of what I call earthly flourishing, uh, which is something where human freedom is necessary but not sufficient because there need to be non-humans involved in developing nomoi of reciprocity and participation. Rivers and non-humans in general are vital parts of this flourishing um, and Herodotus is calling our attention to that in this present moment of the Anthropocene. And the human beings must adopt responsive customs, cultures, and laws that pursue reciprocity. Um, and Herodotus, again, is showing us a model that we could then potentially emulate and putting that freedom in the broader context of earthly flourishing, which is an overarching political good, but one that doesn't depend upon human beings alone. So just to remind you uh, where we've gone, and then we'll have some time for questions, our trip down river I talked about where I was reading from uh, as uh, someone who grew up among rivers uh, and uh, admiring them. Herodotus's histories and, and it's especially in their place in political theory and the history of political thought and ancient political thought. Uh, the two rivers of the Nile and the Borostenes, which we can talk a lot more about. Um, and then thinking about how, what Herodotus might've been doing with his, how he called attention to rivers um, in his context, as well as what we might then um, extrapolate uh, that he would say to the Anthropocene in particular about rivers. So what next? I leave that to you and thank you for your attention. Look forward to the conversation.